let's talk about something fundamental, walking speed. Walking speed affects everything about how your game plays, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I find a lot of indie devs misunderstand the nature of walking speed. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the details. I'm going to teach you a very basic rule called the two second rule. So let's start with Max Caulfield. Max is a, a character in a walking simulator. There's uh, not very much simulation in those games, but there is sure a lot of walking. And Max is a good example of that. She walks slow for a person and glacially for a video game character. On the other side of the spectrum, we've got Fridgeman McShooterface. He's got 1,300 pounds of guns and biceps and armor, uh, and he runs around at Mach 15 shooting aliens on Mars. The speeds couldn't be more different, but that's part of the fantasy. If you're playing as Max, you're playing as a bookworm that never even bothers to run. If you're playing as the Doom Marine, you're playing as a superhero. So you got to get the different movement speeds to get the different fantasies. But it's not just a matter of the narrative tone. The speed of their movement affects everything about how the game is designed. Everything about the levels, the interaction design, the rank up, the pacing, everything about it is determined by their walking speed. Movement speed in general. I'll give you an example. The Doom Marine spots a health pack. There are three possible responses that the Doom Marine can have, or the player can have, when they spot a health pack. One response is, whoa, I stumbled across a health pack. Uh, that came out of nowhere. Another response is, oh, there's a health pack over there. I'll go get it eventually. I'll get around to it someday. And the third response, if the health pack is in the sweet spot, is, okay, I'll, I'll go grab it. That health pack is my next micro objective. That sweet spot is roughly two seconds. What if there's a door? If you're too far from the door, you'd be like, I'll get around to that door after I search the rest of the room. But if that door is around two seconds away, you're going to be like, oh, I should look through that door. How about a monster? Well, you've got a gun, so things are a little bit different here. But if there is a melee monster rushing at you and it's going to take two seconds to reach you, you're going to think, oh, I should deal with that next. You're not going to be panicked about it, but it's going to be your next micro priority. If it's closer than that, you're going to panic a little bit. If it's further away than that, you're going to be like, uh, maybe I'll switch guns first. I got some time. Now this stuff is not some magical human range. It's all based on how you put the levels together. You're the one that put all of these objectives at two seconds away. And obviously not all of your object, not everything is two seconds away. You got stuff that's closer, stuff that's further away. But if you're looking at like a bell curve, the bell curve of how far the player goes to reach stuff is most comfortable at about two seconds. Two seconds for the Doom Marine. If Max goes to Mars and spots that health pack at the end of the hall, that's like a 20 second walk for her. The player is instinctively going to assume something horrible is going to happen while they're walking towards the health pack because it's taking so long to reach. The Doom Marine's like, oh, it's just right there, I'll just grab it. Max is like, whoo, this is um, dicey. Fortunately for Max, she's not looking for health packs on Mars. She's looking at this desk. What's on this desk? Oh, is that a figurine? What's in these cupboards? What's in this bookshelf? What's that slip of paper on the floor? She's looking at things that are inside the room. She's looking at things that are two seconds away. Two seconds for Max is a much shorter range than two seconds for the Doom Marine, but the same basic philosophy applies. And once again, this isn't some magical number. It's how you set up your world. You're going to set up your world such that most of the things that Max is drawn to are two seconds away, if she's supposed to go do them now. 
there are still things further away. Like, oh, look, there is the dorm. We're going to go into the dorm. But that's, you know, 30 seconds away. So we'll walk towards it, but we know it's not our next objective. We're going to have other things on route. Here's a photograph. Here's garbage. Here's someone to talk to. Oh, no, someone got hit by a football. That happened faster than two seconds, so it was surprising to us. You can see the same rules get applied in both situations. I don't want to overstate this. I'm not saying that this is some magic number. I'm not going to try and tell you that you know there is an ideal way to do this. But in general, when you're building a level, you do it with an understanding of what sorts of things the player is going to think are viable to go do now. Like if they spot something, you put it there with the idea that you know how they're going to react to it. And if it's the correct distance away, they're going to just go to it. They're going to be like, oh, that's what I'll get next. Oh, that's the doorway I'll go through next. Oh, that's the painting I'll look at next. And they'll feel comfortable doing it because it's the right distance away. Too close, they'll feel surprised. Too far away, they'll go examine something else first. Now, the thing about this is that since you're the one designing the level, you do not have to choose two seconds. You can push it either direction. If most of your interactables are three seconds or four seconds away, then your game is going to feel slow. And if they're less than two seconds, your game is going to feel fast. This isn't necessarily bad. For example, if you were to play Subnautica, it's a swimming game, on an alien world, and it's considered quite terrifying, right? Well, Subnautica, you actually move pretty quick. You're not a slow diver, but everything you want to interact with is more than two seconds away. It's usually going to be five seconds away. You want to go grab these nodules in this cave and mine some iron or whatever? That's probably a five second swim, maybe even yeah, an eight second swim. That's what gives Subnautica its ponderous feeling. That's what makes Subnautica feel so heavy. It's not that you're slow, it's that all of your objectives are just a little bit too far away to feel comfortable. Combine this with a shrinking air supply and you have a very tense game. This is also partly because the game is in full 3D, you know, vertical elements are important in that game and they're not really something humans naturally think about, so you need to give humans a little bit more brain space, a little bit more time delay to absorb the fact that there is a full 3D world around them and they can go up and down. So that's why this game has such unusual timing, except this isn't unusual timing at all. This is very common among indie games. It's just that this is one of the few games that does it right. For example, there is a game called Paradise Lost that came out. It's a walking simulator. You play, I don't know who he is, uh, a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, someone very, very young who also has gout, I think. Anyway, he sort of walks, kind of. Did you ever play that game where you were an old grandpa in a graveyard? Yeah, he walks like that. And when you hit the run button, your camera zooms in, and you do not run. You walk glacially slow, even for a walking sim game. And that would be fine if the level had been compressed so that the objectives were still two seconds away, or three seconds, or four seconds away from your slow walking speed. But that's just not the case. In this game, you explore a full-sized Nazi bunker. And, uh, you know, it's got all these doors and stuff and all this stuff. And it's huge. It's like a real full-sized bunker. And if you were the Doom Marine, it would be roughly the right size. And it's populated like you're the Doom Marine. If you see a door, well, guess what? That's where you're going. And there is nothing else in this room. And that door, you better hold forward for 15, 20, 30 seconds. That's all there is to do. There are no other interactables. Now, I think they did this on purpose. I think they wanted it to be a horrible slog because it's supposed to be uh, about coping with loss and all that jazz. But there is no mistaking the fact that this game does not feel like 
a horror game. It does not feel like uh, Subnautica, even though the ranges involved might be roughly comparable. Paradise Lost feels like it's just a slog. It does not feel tense. It just feels slow. On the other hand, we've got a million RPG Maker games made by well-meaning tweens, I guess. Uh, and these games generally feature maps that are much, much too big. It's like, oh, look, here is a realistically sized city with like roads and cars and stuff. Uh, and you'll get to you'll get to play around in the city and do this plot I invented for the city. And, and it's like, OK, I guess we'll move through the city. Yeah, you need to go three screens to the right. Do I? Is there anything else in the city? Nope. And similarly, they'll be like, oh, you went into a house. Well, here is your house, right? Here is your house. Here is your, your foyer. Here's your, your, your little duvet. Here's your little TV. Here's your bedroom. Here's your little bed. It's like, what are you doing? And this is a common problem I see with a lot of indie games. They're like, um, I'm not sure how big things should be. Bigger is better, right? Well, if you're building a level, you can simply think of the two-second rule as kind of a basic guideline. How big should this room you're building be? Well, what role does it play? Measure its width in seconds, right? So if we come in here and we find that this room is two seconds wide, like we could walk from one end of the room, if we could walk from the entrance of the room to anywhere in the room in two seconds, then every objective we can see in that room is an immediate objective. It's one we can just do right now. Now, this is not bad. It's not a bad thing at all. It's just something you have to do purposefully. So if we walk into a two-second wide room and we see stuff, that's going to be stuff that we can immediately consider going and grabbing. That's just, like, obviously that those are all things that are viable for our next objective. Now, maybe there's things that are complicating the situation, like, you know, furniture or stuff, but that's all stuff that changes how long it takes to get to places. So if you've got a room that is like, uh, you know, built like this, you got like two seconds and there's a barrier here and then there's two seconds and we measure this in like two second increments just for the sake of discussion, then this would be like, a, a, this would be a room which would have three different sort of two second chambers. Now this is not how you should design the rooms. This is a valid check. This is a way to say, oh, am I in the right ballpark here? So if you build a room like this, then anything you put here, you know that is play the player might consider it to be an immediate objective. If you put something over here, then the player is going to consider it to be, uh, we'll get around to it. You know, it's not that far off. We'll do some other stuff first, and then we'll get around to it. And if you put it here, you know that the player is going to finish off everything else in the room before they go over there, because it's many chunks away, if you see what I mean. we got to pass through this chunk and do it, and then pass through this chunk and do it. Then we'll get around to this chunk. This is not intended to be how you should design levels. But something uh it's it's something i find so many indie game devs get wrong at such a fundamental level they'll just design their levels to be the wrong size usually much much too big if you do that then you are creating a slow game because as i said you're the one that's responsible for putting these objectives on the game so if you make if you make a roblox level right and you put in this giant level ah, oh, it's so cool i'm gonna make this huge awesome roblox level uh, and it's like 400 meters wide or whatever. And then I've got like a shop here. And then I've got like a shop here. And they're like 45 seconds of walking apart. And that's it. It's like, that's a really, really slow experience. Are you sure you want to have your only objectives be so far apart? What's between them? Do you, are you giving the player two second objectives? If not, you need to figure out what the player is going to think the two-second objectives are because that's how fast they're going to think the game is. So if you fill this world with like pets or something and there's a pet every four seconds of walking, then sure, it's going to feel a little slow, but that's fine. If the pets are so numerous that you trip over them constantly and they're all like a second away, like you can't be more than a second away from a pet, it's going to feel very fast. See? 
just a very, very basic validation check, a very, very basic sanity check for the sizing of your levels. And of course, you want to get the fantasy right. You want to walk at the right speed for your fantasy, which means that you need to scale your levels appropriately to the speed you're actually aiming for. I find that a lot of AAA games seem to get this right by just doing a lot of beta testing. Uh, their testers will say that the level feels slow or feels fast, and they'll change the speed or change the level to be smaller or bigger. Presumably, as an indie dev, you would like to get it close to right on your first pass just because you don't have a million testers to test for you. Anyway, I'm sure that this is going to be something a lot of people don't like hearing. Um, it's not, it's a very strange little rule, but it's something that I find really helps to keep levels roughly the right size. And that's it. Have a good one.